Hello, I'm Adrian Gowdy, and in this lecture we're going to talk about the E or Extended Fast Scan, which is one of the primary indications for ultrasound in the emergency setting. So, what's it all about? Well, EFAST stands for Extended Focused Assessment with Sonography in Trauma. And the idea is, like all clinician performed ultrasound, that it is an extension of the clinical examination. It asks a specific question and gets a specific answer. And the particular questions that are asked with this examination are three. Is there free fluid in the abdomen? Is there free fluid in the pericardium? And is there a pneumothorax? Having determined this information, you then interpret it in the clinical setting and hopefully the patient is better off. So how do we do it? Well, to start with, we're going to discuss the abdominal and pericardial component, which is a real-time sonographic examination of four areas. The pericardial, the perihepatic or right upper quadrant, the perisplenic or left upper quadrant, and the pelvic view. So here is the diagram of how to obtain the pericardial view. You'll see that the transducer is placed just to the left of the Ziffy sternum and angled up under the rib cage towards the left shoulder to see the heart. And we look for fluid between the pericardium and the heart. We do need to beware the pleural effusions can be mistaken for pericardial effusions, although it's quite difficult to do this with this particular view. Here is a picture showing me obtaining the pericardial view. You'll see the transducer is pushed into the upper abdomen and then angled up through the left chest to see the heart. And when we do that, this is the view that we'll obtain. Here we have the left lobe of the liver. Here we can see the heart beating with the left ventricle here and the right ventricle on top. Now, for this image, I have the probe in a perpendicular or sagittal plane. We normally have the probe in a horizontal plane, but I've done this to show you the relationship between the free wall of the right ventricle that we can see here and the left lobe of the liver. Between the two, there is the thin fibrous layer of where the diaphragm and the pericardium fuse. There might be one or two millimetres of fluid between the right ventricle and the liver. That's the normal amount of pericardial fluid, but any more than this is abnormal. Occasionally, you can sometimes see a little bit of pericardial fat lying on top of the heart muscle as well. This can also appear black, but it's very small amount and it doesn't have the large black area that surrounds the whole ventricle that you'll see in a pericardial effusion. And we'll see some images of this in a moment. So here's a line diagram that shows that relationship between the free wall of the right ventricle and the liver with just that thin sliver of tissue between. Now in a pericardial effusion, and this is the normal orientation of the probe being more horizontal, we see the left lobe of the liver here. Here we can see the heart. It's easier to see than normal because the fluid surrounds it completely. And here we can see the large amount of black anechoic fluid all the way around the right ventricle here, the left ventricle. And so what we're usually looking for is the relationship between this wall of the right ventricle here and the left lobe of the liver and are the two pressing up against each other, rubbing together, or as in this case, is there fluid between the two that then extends around the heart. Here's the line diagram of what we've just seen. Moving on to the right upper quadrant view. To obtain this, we place the probe in a longitudinal orientation over the lower ribs of the right chest. We tend to start in the mid axillary line and then we can slide posteriorly or superiorly until we obtain the image that we need. Sometimes if we've got a lot of rib shadowing, we might just tilt the probe 15 degrees or so to angle it with the ribs to improve the view a little bit. Here's a picture showing me obtaining this view. What you'll notice is that I rest my little finger on the patient. This helps me with my proprioception, helps stop the probe sliding when I don't want it to, and helps me control the image when I'm trying to adjust it. And this is the image that we hope to see. Here we have the liver 
Here we have the kidney, and we look specifically in this area here, Morrison's pouch, the hepatorenal recess, to see if there is fluid. This is an image from a patient who was a pedestrian who got hit by a bus. What we can see here is the liver. We can see here the kidney, and we see the fluid, the anechoic fluid surrounding the liver, going not only in the Morrison's pouch, but extending up over the top of the liver surface as well. And there's the diagram to show. This shows the normal place that we look for the fluid between the liver and the kidney. For the left upper quadrant, we again orientate the probe in a longitudinal direction. We start in the mid-axillary line, but usually on the left we have to go more posterior. You may need to ask the patient to take a deep breath to help push the spleen down to properly visualise the top of the spleen. And once again, we can tilt the probe a little bit just to try and reduce the rib shadowing. This shows an image. Now, one of the things you'll notice immediately is that the probe is a lot more posteriorly on the left than it was on the right. My hand is resting against the mattress, and this is usually what I need to do to get an image on the left side. When we do so, this is the image we hope to obtain. Here we have the spleen. Here we have the kidney, there's a little granuloma in the spleen, it's an incidental finding. And this is the area we're going to look for fluid. Now, unlike on the right where the fluid does tend to come quite a long way down between the spleen and the kidney, on the left it often sits a little bit higher and tends to go around the tip of the spleen and over the top of the spleen. So this is the area we need to look. This is a diagram showing what we've just seen. And this is a patient who was from a car accident, their car got hit by a truck, and what we can see here is the spleen, we can just make out the outline of the kidney here, and here we have the black fluid in that space coming up over the top of the spleen as well. This is the line diagram that explains this. Now the pelvic view, we place the probe just above the symphysis pubis, and we look in two planes. We look with the probe transverse and then we turn the probe and we scan from side to side to make sure we've covered the entire pelvis. Here this shows the image of obtaining the transverse view and then we rotate the probe for the longitudinal view. This is the image that we'll obtain. This is in a female patient. Here we have the bladder which usually appears rectangular shape in the transverse view. Here we have the vaginal stripe. The longitudinal view, here we have the bladder here. We have the shattering from the symphysis pubis, so we're not going to see this area here. We have some bowel gas here with some dirty shadowing. And right down the bottom here, we have a tiny little trace of free fluid. Now one of the other things you may see, especially in the pelvic view, is what we refer to as bowel floating in fluid. And what we see is here is bowel, and this is easier to see in real time because you see the bowel move about. And then we have this black area lying between the loops of bowel. One of the things that you need to look at is the shape of that fluid, because bowel can be filled with fluid as well. But bowel filled fluid, the fluid is round, whereas fluid that is between bowel tends to have sharp edges because you've got circular structures and the fluid squeeze between them. Now in general, free fluid appears black and we sometimes refer to that as anechoic or sonolucent. However, ultrasound cannot tell you what the fluid is. Blood, urine or ascites pretty much all appear the same. Now sometimes you might see some clots in the blood and some sediment in the blood, but especially when you're starting off, they all tend to look pretty much the same. So what you have to remember is that you need to use the clinical context to interpret the findings. As a general rule, you need between 100 and 500 mils of fluid in order to see it on ultrasound. If the bladder is empty, 
and the patient is very large and you're not as experienced, you'll need more fluid. In a thin person with a full bladder, you'll see the much smaller amounts of fluid. Now, just to try and emphasize to you that the context of this information is very, very important, here is a case that we saw of a 50-year-old alcoholic woman. She'd been assaulted by her son one day before. She was covered in bruises. She came in hypotensive, hypothermic, and with a haemoglobin of 53. When we did the scan, this is the right upper quadrant. We can see here the liver. This is a rib shadow. This isn't a fracture in the liver. We see the rib here and some black shadowing, so ignore that. Here is the kidney, and surrounding we have anechoic fluid all the way around. However, because she had liver failure, we didn't know whether this was ascites or whether it was blood. So after correcting her coagulopathy, we actually performed an abdominocentesis which showed straw-coloured fluid with no blood. And on further examination and investigation, we determined that her blood loss was actually from vaginal bleeding secondary to her coagulopathy, not from intra-abdominal bleeding. So why do we bother with all this? Well, in my opinion, the management of trauma patient has two fundamental pillars. One is thoroughness. You need to examine these patients and re-examine them to make sure that nothing is missed. And secondly, prioritisation. You need to find their important life-threatening injuries first and deal with them first. We need to work out what needs to be done and when. And this is really where the fast examination comes into its own. So when we ask the questions of the examination, we have to make sure that we ask the right questions. And the right questions for the abdominal component is, is there significant intraperitoneal bleeding? The wrong questions, the ones that we can't answer very well with fast scan, include, is there any intraperitoneal bleeding? We can miss small amounts. Is there any intra-abdominal injury? You can miss solid organ injuries, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And certainly the question that cannot be answered by the fast exam alone is, can you send your patient home? So when I'm dealing with a trauma patient and I'm trying to answer my question, what options have I got? Well, the first is clinical examination. And we all know that in the multi-trauma patient, this has a very poor sensitivity and specificity. And if the patient's unconscious, it's even worse. DPLs, we used to do them quite a lot. They're invasive, they have a complication rate, and they don't actually have that great sensitivity and specificity either. CT has very good sensitivity and specificity. It will not only pick up free fluid, it'll pick up solid organ injuries as well, and maybe even viscous injuries. However, many of us will have experienced the time when the patient's gone off to the donut of death and suddenly the alarm bells start ringing. Your patient's out of your department. They're in an environment which is not good for ongoing resuscitation if they become unstable. And finally, we have ultrasound. So ultrasound has some very good points. It's rapid. We can do it at the bedside. It's non-invasive. If we ask the right question, it has very good sensitivity and specificity. It's easily repeatable, so if the condition changes, we can do it again. And we may pick up some specific injuries, such as solid organ injuries, especially if you've got experience, but you can't rely on that. The downside of ultrasound needs to be recognised. It has very poor sensitivity sensitivity and specificity for the wrong question. It is very operator dependent. 10% of scans in a recent survey were indeterminate, and in particular that's because of the pelvis view. Now that will improve with experience, but sometimes it's just due to the fact that the patient has an empty bladder, they have too much bowel gas, you can't get the image you need. And in that case, don't be afraid to say, I can't tell this is indeterminate. Don't forget, even though the machines are really fun to play with, that there's still a patient in there under all those tubes and blankets and covers and so forth. Just because it's a test doesn't mean it's right. 
you have to put the information into the context of the patient. And finally, there are some other specific issues with ultrasound, such as arguments between who should be performing them. Fortunately, this is getting less and less with time. There is credentialing and quality control issues that we've already discussed that you must follow. The machines, although they're getting cheaper, are still quite expensive. They're not expensive by radiology department standards, but they are expensive by emergency department standards. And don't forget infection control. These patients often have a lot of blood and so forth around them, so pop a probe cover on to try and keep it all clean, please. This is an algorithm taken from an article in 2004 that looked at the role of the fast scan in the trauma patient. And in the patient who is unstable, this really is where the fast scan shines. If it's positive, the patient's unstable, you go to theatre. If it's negative, then you need to look for other sources of bleeding. Or if you still think that there may be something going on in the abdomen, you may have to perform a DPL, although this is rare. In the stable patient, the fast scan has a less important role. If it is positive, and occasionally you will see this and you get a surprise, then generally we would send the patient to CT, although if it's penetrating trauma, we may go straight to theatre. If the fast scan is negative and the patient is stable, if the mechanism still is highly suggestive or you have high clinical suspicion, we generally will still perform a CT scan. Some places are using serial fast scans to help monitor patients, but this isn't routine practice yet. So in my mind, the fast scan inhabits the same space in terms of abdominal injury as the chest x-ray does for chest injuries. Just because I do a chest x-ray doesn't mean that I'm not going to do a chest CT. And, but what it does tell me is things that I might need to know immediately that I need to deal with very rapidly. And so for the fast scan, it's very useful in the hypotensive patient where it can help determine whether the appropriate intervention is laparotomy, maybe thoracotomy, or angiography. Now, what are the pitfalls of this technique? Well, as we've already mentioned, there are some injuries you will not see with ultrasound. This is from a study, quoted from a study, where ultrasound was performed by highly experienced sonographers and interpreted by consultant radiologists. And in 26% of patients who had solid organ injury, they did not have a hemoperitoneum. Remember, that's what we're looking for, free fluid on this scan. In half of those patients, there were no signs seen on ultrasound by experienced sonographers. So we're likely to miss a lot more than that. Retroperitoneal hemorrhage also can be particularly difficult to diagnose with ultrasound. Don't forget, fluid flows with gravity and therefore you need to look in the most dependent place. If your patient's been lying on one side, that's probably where the fluid's going to be. If the bladder is empty, this makes things much more difficult. And there are some institutions that will routinely insert a catheter and inflate the bladder so that they will get better pelvic views. Don't forget other causes of intra-abdominal fluid, such as ascites, a ruptured bladder. Now that needs fixing, but again, the priorities will be different if it's a ruptured bladder to if it's, say, a ruptured spleen. And make sure that you don't confuse fluid inside the stomach or intestines with free fluid. As we've mentioned, the, because it is such a quick examination, you can repeat it if the clinical situation changes. And in those circumstances, serial examinations may be very informative. So, putting it all together, Ultrasound can rapidly tell you if there is a moderate to large amount of free fluid in the abdominal cavity. In the appropriate setting, this may determine the need for urgent or immediate laparotomy. But the ultrasound image on its own 
will never be the sole determinant of these decisions. Now moving on <clears throat> to the lung component of the examination. Once again, this is a real-time sonographic examination, this time of the most anterior chest spaces. We look at the parasternal regions on the left and right chest. We look for what I describe as the bat, and we look for the sliding sign, and we'll go through some of the other ancillary signs as well of pneumothorax. So this shows you where we perform the exam. When a patient is supine, lying on their back, these are the areas that pneumothoraxes will tend to be seen because this is the most anterior part of the chest. And so this is where we start looking. We place the probe in a longitudinal orientation and we look for the ribs. Now this is a rib here, this is a rib here. And this is the pleural surface which is a half to one centimetre beneath the surface of the rib. And this shape has been described as being like the body and the wings of a bat. When we do that, we then look for sliding the pleural surface. Now here I've actually changed the probe around so we can't see the ribs, but this is the pleural line here. And what we see, it's been likened to a trail of ants running backwards and forwards, but we see the lung surface sliding against the pleural surface here, the visceral and the parietal pleura. All this area down here, because the lung's full of air, this is all artifact, so we can't interpret anything on here. All we're looking for is that one line. Now, if the lung is not up against the chest wall sliding, then you won't see the sliding sign. So that will occur in a pneumothorax because you'll have air in that space instead. It'll occur if the lung is collapsed and it's not being ventilated. Sometimes that can happen if the patient's intubated, the tube's in the right main bronchus, you won't see any sliding on the left, and that might tell you that the tube's down too far. Pleural adhesions can also prevent lung sliding. So here is a patient, here we've got the rib, the rib, here is our bat, here is the pleural surface. So this is the surface we're going to look at when we run the loop, we can see there's no sliding there, no ants running back and forth. And that's because this here is air outside the lung. This has been described by Daniel Lichtenstein, who did a lot of the work in this area, as dead air. Whereas air inside lung, which is moving, he describes as living air. And I think that's quite a nice description. One of the other things we can look for is what's called the lung point sign. And this is where the sliding appears and disappears with respiration. And this is the most accurate diagnostic sign of a pneumothorax. And in fact, we can use this to estimate the size of the pneumothorax because what this represents is the lung as it inflates coming up against the chest wall. Now, because we only see that front surface, what we see is it looks like it's sliding in and out. So here we have a rib, here we have a rib, here is the pleural surface that we're looking at. And what you'll see is here, dead air, nothing happening. Here, we see the sliding. And the sliding moves out, and as the patient inspires again, it will come, it'll move back and forth with inspiration and expiration. And so depending on where that is, we can judge how big the pneumothorax is. If that's right near the sternum anteriorly, it's a small pneumothorax. But if it's right around the side, then it's a large pneumothorax. Lung comets are reverberation artifacts that arise from the visceral pleura. Now they're quite common, you'll see them in 60% of normal patients. And their presence excludes the pneumothorax because what they're saying is you're seeing the visceral pleura. If you're seeing the visceral pleura, then there is no free air in the chest cavity at that point. The nicest thing about lung comets is they make the sliding very easy to see. And here we see rib here, pleural surface, rib, in fact, pleural surface, a little bit of the heart there. And we see sliding back and forth, sliding sign, and these bright white lines down here are the lung comets. So how good is lung ultrasound? Well, the pneumothorax 
it has a very high specificity. It also has a high sensitivity, but that does depend a little bit on just how hard you go looking for the pneumothorax. If you search every rib space very carefully, you might see the much smaller pneumothoraxes, whereas if you only look through it in a couple of spaces, you might miss very small pneumothoraxes. However, it is much, much better than a supine chest x-ray, but it's not quite as good as CT. In general, the sensitivity is over 90% for lung ultrasound for pneumothorax, and if you spend a little bit more time, it's actually even better than that. So thank you very much, and during the course, we'll go through first on normal models, how to perform these examinations, how to look at all these things in the abdomen, and then we're going to get some CAPD patients who've got free fluid in their abdomen so you can learn to see where free fluid collects and what it looks like. Thank you very much.